So uh, we were talking about uh, the ways of, uh, different ways of answering questions. First thing we established is don't just accept the question. If there's something wrong with the question, fix it first. Don't start proceeding based on that premises. That's the first thing. First technique we discussed, you flip the question around to get them to think about it. So the one last one we were doing, is people ask you, and this happens many times, why do bad things happen to good people? Their argument is that if someone's good, nothing bad should happen to them. So realistically, all you have to do is get them to extend that argument further. Push that argument, get them to push it, and they'll see that it's just they're asking for an impossible world. They're asking for a euphoria where nothing goes wrong, nobody slips and falls, and no one gets hurt or scratched or cut. So that's Jinnah, that's later. They're asking for Jinnah right now. When you push the argument, they get to realize what's wrong with it. So like some of you reversed it, why do good things happen to bad people? The guy's a criminal and stuff and good things happening for him. Robs a bank, gets away with it and spends the cash. And, and something, <laughs> that's something good, any, according to them. It shouldn't happen to him. Or you flip it around and just ask them, how much intervention do you want? Every time something bad is about to happen, you want God to intervene. You know, protect this person and stop that from happening, stop that from happening. Again, that's Jannah, that's later. You're asking for Jannah on earth then. So you flip the argument around. Page 63, the other way, another way of answering questions, another technique is that you use facts. And we all do this, it's not like we're, we're learning anything new. And a lot of times what we do in this course is we unlearn the wrong way of giving da'wah. We unlearn the wrong way of giving da'wah. Many ways that we, we, and we think that this is how you give da'wah, we find out that no, it's not the best way actually. So, you use facts. So many statements are factually and historically inaccurate. So you use the facts to, re to refute claims and answer questions. So for example, on page 63, the first one says that more people die because of religion than anything else on earth. How many times have you heard that? You heard that before? Many times, non Muslims say that to you. And you're at a da'wah table and someone tells you, no, sorry, I don't talk about religion because religion is responsible for more death than anything else. And, and, and how do you refute that? Nam? Yeah, you use facts. Yeah, it's, it's inaccurate. So you start looking at wars around the world and throughout history, and then you start to see that first of all, the majority of them were not about religion, or they were about you know money, taking over people's land. And even those that are about religion, it wasn't just about religion. They brought religion in as one of the factors. So, World War I, how many people died? 25 million. World War II? 50, some estimates go as high as 60 some million and this was just you know, one war and it didn't really have much to do with, uh, with religion there was some ideology involved but it wasn't a religion so what about all the other wars, uh, the Prussian wars, the hundred years war all these civil wars, millions of people dying just Napoleon, you know how many, he got a million of his own people just his own soldiers, not counting those that they killed just a million of his own men died, what was he doing? what was that all about? It wasn't about religion, you know, go up to the Alps, it gets too cold, it goes to Egypt for the summer. And <laughs> so, when you do the math, more people die because of land and money than anything else. So that means that next time you, that person has a job interview, and they ask him how much would you like to be making, he should stop the interviewer and say, sorry, I don't talk about money, more people die because of money than anything else on earth. Yeah? So it's actually not true. Um, B, why do you cut off the hand of the thief? And this is as a ruling, I'm not, maybe it's not being practiced too much now. One time I saw uh, some kind of uh, interfaith thing on television. It was basically really an opportunity to gang up on the Muslim. So they brought some girl from a university, young girl. They put her on, on this panel and everybody turned on her. You guys cut off the hand of the thief and that's barbaric and how dare you. And so she started to immediately apologize. She said, um, we, we don't do that anymore, only one country is doing it. And she should have just added, inshallah they'll stop soon. You know? So how can you use facts here? Using some facts or any incident, anything. Any. Number of prison <coughs> and the number of people in the prison. Excellent. Excellent. <coughs> Excuse me. So here now you, we can use facts. So they're, they're assuming that you know, prison is better than this. 
uh, that the Sharia prescribed punishment. So if someone steals, you put them in jail. But then there are many problems with that. Many problems with that. You know, for one, if somebody steals something and you put them in jail, you're not just punishing him. You're punishing a number of people, right? If you know, if that person's married, you're punishing his wife, or maybe you're giving her a treat, <laughs> depending on. <laughs> All right, sisters. <laughs> so you're punishing the wife, the parents, the children. All these people are not, being, are not going to see this individual anymore. Then they go to jail, and then they're treated really, really badly there. And uh, then you can look at other statistics. For example, uh, like 82% of people who leave prison, they return. So that means it doesn't rehabilitate. It's very bad. Yeah? Actually, one time a friend of mine, he, he used to give a halakha at the prison. So one time he asked the prisoners, he said, Who in here would rather have their hand cut off today and be with their family tomorrow? What do you think is of the percentage of people who put their hands up? What do you think? Every single one of them. 100% of them put their hands up. Yeah, take it off. I want to be with my family tomorrow. This place is a nightmare. They, get, and that's, they don't even get the prescribed punishment. Yeah, I mean, someone stole and the judge says, your punishment is that you're kept away from society for 15 years. But is that the only punishment that he gets? No. Yeah, and he's beaten, he's attacked, he's insulted. And, and it's legal to beat him up really bad and stuff. All these things, we're talking about human rights and all this is happening here. And so it has become a big business, you know. You know, since the 80s, like uh, spending on, on public schools and on education has increased by 74% since the 80s until now. But on prisons, 314%. So it's, it's business. And these people go and they come back again and it just gets worse and worse and worse. So... So the cutting off the, the hand of the thief, it's a deterrent, and it works. For, for decades in Islamic history, there were only six hands that were cut. Just six. Just six hands that were cut. Compared to, now if you want to use statistics, you know, every 16 seconds, a, a, a car is stolen. Every 18 seconds, a house is broken into. Every six seconds, a woman is assaulted. We're talking about seconds now. Seconds. Versus, you know, 70 years, 100 years, six hands being cut only. And by the way, the Sharia is not bloodthirsty. I mean, a lot of people, even, even Muslims, they imagine that the Sharia, like the state, wants blood. You know? Like that's how it operates. Remember as a kid, there was this movie. This guy goes to Turkey and he steals an orange. And they capture him. And they bring him to this place in the market where all these people are just standing around and they're cheering as people's hands get cut off. Yeah. Like these are just regular Muslims. They're just standing there. And then, you know, the camera cuts away and you just hear a hand being cut. And all these Muslims go, ah! They're so happy. <laughs> like, is this a Muslim state? People just want to see blood? Like, hey, so, hey, you free? Let's go watch some hands being cut off. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> we go and just like, yes! And they're so happy that the hand was cut. And, and plus, yeah, I mean, do you cut off the hand for an orange in Islam? It's just all inaccurate. The Islamic state is not bloodthirsty, yeah? And uh, you know, when you look at the, the rulings for, for zina and things like that... Uh, the, the idea isn't to try to get people punished. Yeah, and even if you look at the stipulations for establishing like, proof that someone has committed zina, they're very difficult. Yeah? Like uh, four witnesses. And these witnesses have to have seen something very, very specific. Yani, not just movement, but very specific. You know, like, you know, they have to have seen Pennsylvania and Virginia. You understand? That's... <laughs> And then they have to be four upright and righteous individuals. Like you're going to find four mashayikh who are like, where are you going to find this? Yani? It doesn't happen like that. So the idea isn't to try to just get people. You know, the state, the Muslim state isn't out to get people. Right? You know the story of the woman who committed zina. She came to the Prophet and he, he turned, sallallahu alayhi wa he turned from her. She came again and he turned this way. Or the man who came to the Prophet and he says, I committed zina. Prophet turned away from him. He came from the other side. One more time, Prophet turned away from him. The third time, Prophet turned away from him. Then he asked him, Abika Junoon, are you crazy? And do you have any mental issues? And he asked uh, his people, about, his tribe, about him. In one narration, he had someone smell his mouth to see if he's drunk. In one narration, and he also tells him, La'allaka qabbal, so perhaps you just kissed her. And he says, No, I actually did what a man does with his wife. He's being very specific here. But he. The, the idea, especially if someone is going to testify against themselves, they're actually encouraged in court not to testify against themselves. They're encouraged not to testify against themselves. That's why judges would say, would ask someone, Asaraqt qulla. Did you still say no? He's telling him the answer. Don't testify against yourself. 
It's not like the state is bloodthirsty or anything, but that's the image you get in Hollywood. That's what a lot of Muslims think, that it's just this barbaric state that wants to see limbs fly, wants to see blood and stuff. But it's a very good deterrent. You know, I always use the example of the, the drug dealer in Saudi Arabia. What happens to the drug dealer in Saudi Arabia? Yeah, it's executed. That's great. I think we should do that in the United States. And then how many cool drug dealers will be driving their, their vehicles with their heads cut off? It would be excellent. Nobody would want to be a drug dealer. Yeah, he's got spinners on his car, but no head. <laughs> Fantastic. Great deterrent, you know? And subhanAllah, these people, they encourage you. There was one drug dealer in New York City. He used to make $60,000 a day from one corner, and he had multiple corners. They say because of this one guy, he was a young guy, he's very popular, he's in jail now. Yeah? Because of him, tens of shabab went to jail, because everyone was trying to be like him. But if his head was cut off, nobody would, try to be, would want to be like him. You know, it's a good deterrent. You should consider that here. Maybe you guys in California can start it. Yeah? California, forget about it. <laughs> so, so then what happens is people try to shame you and you know, put you in the corner and get you to apologize for the religion of Allah. So our system works. It's been proven to work. It's a good deterrent. And that's how it works. It's scary and it's a deterrent. Yeah? Nobody wants their hand cut off, so it's not worth stealing. But there's also another side to it. Yani there's the side where yani the taqwa, you know, having, being God conscious, that's the first reason you don't want to steal. Then the second, for those who are not, you don't have enough yani taqwa, is there's a strong physical deterrent. And that's why it works. That's why in Islamic history there were times when you would leave money and three days later you find it there. Yeah? And if you ever study the, the laws of luqata, uh, yani when you find something on the floor, Anybody? Any, any one of the courses? If you ever study that, you'll never pick up anything off the floor. You don't want to deal with that. It's a huge responsibility, you know? So that's how people work. So, you can use facts to respond to a question or to answer questions. By the way, for the first one, there's another very strange one. I'll just mention it for what it's worth, yeah? And uh, a lot of times, and actually I've never, I mostly get this question from Muslim sisters. They say, why is it that a man can marry four and a woman can't marry four? Are you serious? Did you even think about this question? Did you even think about it? You know where this question comes from? It comes from the radical feminist movement. See, the feminist movement isn't all bad. Yani. And for example, who in here believes that if a man and a woman have equal skills, equal level of education, they should get the same salary? Come on, brothers. Yeah. So you now you're all feminist. It's not a bad thing. That's, that's what a feminist is. But you know why we, have, we think of it in a bad way? Because there's something called radical feminism. There's liberal feminism, social feminism. There's radical feminism. Radical feminists, these are the crazy ones. These are the ones that uh, you know, say, why is it his story and not her story? And, <laughs> and, they, and they actually want to spell women, uh, W-O-M-Y-N, women. They say they want to take the men out of women. <laughs> Crazy. Take the men out of women. What kind of life would that be? So the point is, is <laughs> they, they're the ones that are crazy. So their goal in life is to be like the man. Whatever the man does, we have to do. He's a bus driver, we're bus drivers. He's a firefighter, we can be firefighters. He was a boxer, we'll box also. So their, their only goal in life is to be like the man. So if the man can do it, we should be able to do it. And that's the, always that's the way they're thinking. They just want to compare themselves to the man. They want to be like the man. As if being a man is such a great thing. It is, brothers, isn't it? <laughs> Come on. It's great, isn't it? Just kidding, sisters. Then you know there's a dua in the Jewish religion. When they wake up, the man thanks Allah for not being born a woman. You know that? Can you imagine that, sisters? Astaghfirullah. That's the only thing in the Jewish religion I agree with, actually. Um, <laughs> kidding, kidding, sisters. Sisters already getting upset. <laughs> you know my policy with upsetting sisters when I travel somewhere? In a few days I leave and you have to deal with that. <laughs> so, <laughs> now sisters, we'll be friends tomorrow, sisters. They always get upset with me on the first night. Tomorrow we'll be friends, inshallah. They don't even believe it. You. You're looking this way, you can't see their expressions now. Some of them are saying, Alhamdulillah, I didn't pay for this yet. 
I can leave. <laughs> okay. So, uh, where were we here before we got... Uh, yeah, we were talking about the, the radical feminist movement. And so they just want to be like the men. Whatever the man does, want to be like the man. So this has affected even Muslim women living in the West. So they'll come up to you and ask you such a ridiculous question. Why can a, a, a woman marry for? Are you serious? Did you even think about this question? Did you even think about it? So what is this, Yani? She, she marries four, then she has to cook and clean for four, maybe. And then she has to bear children for four men. And it's just impossible. And it's very dirty, too. I mean, what kind of a question is that? Then they also ask you things like, well, how come there wasn't a female prophet of Allah? Now, does that make women any less, I mean, or, or would women be any better if there was in the past a female prophet? It's just like, oh, if there was a male, there has to be a female. No, not necessarily. And actually, it wouldn't be a good deal to have a female prophetess of Allah. It doesn't even sound right. But it wouldn't be a good deal at all. It's an unfair thing. She has to, where, where is the, where they're waiting for, where is the prophetess of Allah? And, uh, Allah, she's, at that time of the month, she can't lead the salah. Someone else, okay, brother, you lead. You lead, yeah? And then she has to go out on these expeditions, walking for two months, you know. And she could be pregnant during that time. And they're like, everyone's helping her up. And she's like, you know, <laughs> pregnant. Oh, hey, are you okay? And labor pains. Uh, you know, asbari. They have patience and trust in Allah. <laughs> You're a prophet. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. But people just, that's all they think about. The man does it, we have to do it. So who said the man is a role model for women? I'll tell you something else. It's, very, it's, a, yeah, and it's a quote. One of, the, one of the scholars said, to treat two, equal, two, two different things as equal, is a form of injustice. One more time. To treat two different things as equal is a form of injustice. True or false? Very true. Let's just simplify it. You know, you work at uh, some kind of warehouse. You take these big hundred pound sacks and you drop them. You know, a couple of feet, these big burly men. They grab it, they walk away. Then a 14 year old girl comes. She goes like this, throw me one. And you think to yourself, okay, well, you know, Treat them all as equal, inshallah, I'm an equal opportunist. And you just drop it on her and you crush her. To treat two different things as equal is a form of injustice. So and don't just ask, well, how come the man, uh, uh, you know, there hasn't been a female prophet? It would be very unfair. It would be a very difficult situation for her. You know? And then when, if someone marries this prophet of, of God, this woman, uh, who's the boss then in the house? You know? huh? The man, right? But then Allah revealed something, then what? <laughs> like, I know Allah revealed this ayah to you, but I say, stay home today. <laughs> you can't leave. <laughs> Problems. Okay. All right, let me try to become friends with the sisters again. <clears throat> By the way, did you guys hear the joke about the, the dumb brothers who said no? I didn't work, sisters, I'm sorry. I tried. I tried to make fun of the brothers. Okay, number three. You always start with the simplest explanation first. That's another rule when you answer questions. You answer, you start with the simplest explanation. I know a lot of brothers, they love long-winded explanations. And one time I said, I, I asked a group of Muslims, okay, how do you answer this question to a non-Muslim? One of them, well, you have explained to them that there are two types of the qadr and irada of Allah. Are you, are you serious? Just give the simplest explanation first. If it works, alhamdulillah, you move on to your topic. If it doesn't work, then you can go to a more sophisticated one. This is for Muslims or non-Muslims as well. Sometimes even with a Muslim, they ask you a question, you just give them a simple analogy, they understand it, they move on. Without going into great detail. So if you can suffice with the simple one, go with the simple one first. So we look at a specific example here, and this might deal with a Muslim or a non-Muslim in, in our times now. Uh, the question is, why is the apostate killed in Islam? Why is the apostate killed in Islam? And I'd like to mention something here that's... Uh, yani, it's a common mistake. What's, what's the, uh, the verb form? When someone leaves Islam, in English, what is it? Naam? Yeah, the verb form that someone has. I see a lot of this, that's why I mentioned it. A lot of times people think it's apostated. There's no such word as apostated. Yeah? The verb form is actually strange. It's apostatized. So when you, when you leave Islam, you apostatize. You don't apostate. Apostate is a, is a noun. Yeah? It's the act of abandoning one's religion. Uh, or apostasy is the act of abandoning one's religion. Apostate is the person who has abandoned their religion. And to apostatize is the verb form. So why do you kill someone if they apostatize? That's the question. So now here, and this is actually a true story. This was a missionary in our school. 
Uh, it was someone who teaches Bible study. So he came and asked me this question. Now, I, I know that he's just trying to embarrass me because of a number of things. One, because of the fake look of concern on his face. That was the first giveaway. The second is that he was just a few minutes ago telling me about his friends who are missionaries in Morocco and they're trying to convert people there and he was angrily telling me that they're not successful because you guys, you know, you kill the apostate. So he says, why do you kill someone if they leave Islam? So now I have three answers for him in my head, okay? But I'm just trying to prove this point that I wanted to start off with the simplest one first. And if it doesn't work, I can go to the next one. And if it doesn't work, I can go to the next one. But if the simplest one works, I can move on to my main point, which is discussing Tawheed with this person. So I asked him a simple question. One sentence, and he immediately said, I understand. I said, okay, what is the punishment for treason? And he said, I understand. That was it. Is that simple? Start with the simple one first. Because... He understood now that if someone leaves their allegiance to their country, the ruling is, they should be killed. Right? I think just this year, or that they just changed it in Canada. Two years ago they changed it in Australia. But uh, in the good old US, it's still, the, I think, the same. Yeah? So if someone leaves their country, they should be killed. So if they leave their allegiance to Allah, جل, nothing happens. So the minute I made the comparison, he said, I understand. But you know what? Suppose he didn't like that comparison. So, I don't like that. Still, I don't agree. I don't even agree with treason. But I have something else for him. And because he teaches Bible study, I had for him Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy in the Bible, chapter 13, verse 8 and 9. Which basically is the same ruling in his own book. And you teach this book and you're asking me this question. So I was going to quote it for him, but we didn't have to go there. But I was going to tell him, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 8 and 9. Because there it's different. There it's a mess. There it says, and who, yeah, the one who leaves his religion, you know, kill him and let your hand be the first to reach him. And you be the first one to kill him. So we pray, Aisha, salam alaykum, salam alaykum. did you hear about Brother Hassan? Let's go pay him a quick visit, yeah? And so, according to the Bible, you want your hand to be the first. But when he opens the door, <laughs> right? So, by the way, in Islam, of course, you know it's a very different system. It's not like someone, you heard that someone leaves Islam and you just go get him and stuff like that. First of all, it's done by the authorities. There are procedures and steps involved. First of all, they, they talk to him yeah, about... Uh, and the, the scholars really refute any doubts that he has on the issue. And they can spend days with him, refuting and arguing with him, trying to convince him. Then they might even uh, yeah, and they threaten him with the sword. They tell him, you need to repent from this, because if you don't repent, you, you will be killed. And if he insists on being killed, that means he's really, really believing in that. And then, and after the procedures take their toll, and then at the end, by the authority of the ruling body, it's done. It's not just like the brothers after Aisha go visit someone, and stuff like that. So it's not like, but according to the Bible, just, you know, let your hand be the first to strike him, yeah? So it's different. And, and I have to say this because one time in our area, there was a brother who reverted to Islam, and then he left Islam in about a week or two. So one other brother, and he was also revert, subhanAllah, he said, oh, he left Islam? You know, I'm going to take him out hunting, we're going to have an accident. <laughs> yeah. He really thought it was his job. Yeah. And he was like, Brother, could you go check if that a deer over there? And you, boom. He's going to pull a Dick Cheney on that guy. <laughs> yeah. so, so, it's not how it's done at all. Yeah. So that was the second argument I had ready for him. But I didn't have to go there because the simplest one worked. Alhamdulillah. But even if he didn't like that one, I had another one for him. Right? This is verse... 72 or 73 in Surah Al-Imran. وَقَالَ الطَّائِفَةُ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ آمِنُوا بِالَّذِي أُنزِلَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَجْهَ النَّهَارِ وَاكْفِرُوا آخِرَهُ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ So this, is a, this was a, a, a plot by the Jews of Medina. When Islam entered Medina, they would pretend to enter into Islam in the morning. So 10, 12 people would become Muslim in the morning. Then at night they leave. Same night they leave Islam. Tomorrow a group becomes Muslim. Then the same day they leave Islam. Towards the end of the day, they leave Islam. So what happens to the non-Muslim or the, the non-Jewish Medinian who is contemplating perhaps becoming a Muslim? He sees that it's not worth becoming a Muslim. There's no substance there. People re leave their religion the same day. Groups just enter and leave the same day. You know, if you leave in a month, maybe you discovered something. But if you leave in a day, that means there's just nothing there. 
So they tried to do that to deter people from becoming Muslim. It was a, it was a technique. Then the Nabi Sallallahu said, مَنْ بَدَّلَ دِينُهُ فَاقْتُلُوهُ The one who changes his religion, kill him. How many people do you think pretended to be Muslim the next day? Zero. Nobody wanted him because then there's killing involved. So that was my third explanation for him. So the first one didn't work, use the second one, use the third one. But so we, at, what we try to do is start with the simplest one. Because I want to move on to something more important. Yeah? Unless that's the only issue. It could be a Muslim, and they might ask you that, and I might start in this case from the third one. Right? Because if it's a Muslim asking me this question, I don't have to do number two, I don't have to quote the Bible. I don't have to maybe give the comparison with treason. I'll just start with number three immediately. If it's a non-Muslim, I might follow these steps. Yeah? Um, type. Anyone want to add anything to that? And by the way, I, mean, I always say this, uh, feel free to disagree with me. Feel free also to take and leave from most of the things that I say. For the most part, a lot of the things we discuss are suggestions, yeah? And uh, suggested methods and techniques. And you as a da'i, you see, in this situation that I'm in, what is the best method to use? So you, you draw on or you pull from any of these, and you might use it in that situation. And feel free to disagree with me. Okay, you can put your hand up and disagree. That's, there's no problem with that. You don't have to just agree with me because, you know, I came from overseas or an instructor or anything like that. Feel free to disagree. But if you're going to disagree, just have some kind of evidence or some kind of study. And I'll accept it. And the reason I insist on these two things is that one time a guy was just disagreeing with me on my most important point. And in the end I asked him, okay, what are you basing this on? He says, I'm guessing. So, we can't have any of that, right? Alright, so that was number three. Now, number four, explain the concept and the purpose behind something. So, from, I'm reading from the notes, sometimes it's hard to understand the details without the bigger picture. Make sure you explain the reasons and wisdoms before you proceed. So for example, someone says, and this is sometimes even from Muslims, how could your prophet ride on a winged horse? They're talking about Barak really, talking winged horse and things like that. So how could, your prophet, how could you believe that your prophet rode on a horse that you know, t flies to Bayt al-Maqdis or what have you? How do you answer that? Who wants to go? Sisters, anybody? Yes sir. What's the big deal? And he, if Allah created the heavens and the earth, if there is a God, if He is a genuine prophet, now is this a difficulty now? And if Allah created the heavens and the earth, just moving someone from point A to point B, is, that, is this a big deal? You know, Muslims will ask you many times, how can you believe the story of uh, Jibreel السلام, coming down, opening the chest of the Prophet السلام, taking his heart out, washing it, and putting it back in, and then they tell you things, look, look what they say, with no anesthesia, no stitching. <laughs> Are you serious? How do you answer this one? It's simple. I just say, consider the, church, the, the surgeon. Look who's doing the surgery. That's all. Yeah, and if you tell me Dr. Chowdhury did it, then okay. Like, okay, that's, I don't believe that. But, Shadeed al Quwa, the most powerful of the angels, Jibreel, the archangel, alayhi salam, he is the surgeon. I have believe it. It's not a, and if you can believe in Jibreel, alayhi salam, 600 wings, and each one of them would cover the horizon, it's easy for me to believe this. So if you consider the surgeon, it makes sense. Look at the bigger picture here. Tell me anesthesia and all that stuff. Who is the surgeon? Right? Anyone want to add to that? I thought I saw someone's hand up. Okay. So, um, another person says, oh, let, me, let me give you this one. This is also a true story. Someone came up to me and he said, Why does God care if I, have, if I eat pork or not? He used to eat pork, this guy. He was born Muslim, yani, but... She says, why does God care if I eat pork or not? Shouldn't God care about big things like if I murder someone, if I steal, if I lie? Why does He care if I look at the menu and I order number 9 and it has pork in it? You see? How do you answer that? Give me the bigger picture, somebody. Naam? He doesn't? But He doesn't allow it, yani, is what He's trying to say. Yani, it's not acceptable and it's punishable, right? Khalid, Fadda. Ahsan. Very good. So that's the bigger picture. So when you, it's sure, the act of saying, give me number nine and paying for it, the act is simple. But it comes under a bigger umbrella, a bigger picture. 
That is, you're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doesn't matter how simple the act was, right? You know the saying of the early Muslims, لا تنظر إلى صغر المعصية ولكن انظر إلى عظمة من عصيت. Right? Don't look at how small the sin is, but look at the greatness of the one you're sinning against. You don't say, well, what's just, I just said, give me number nine, and she just, I paid three ninety nine for it, and it's a simple procedure. Sure, it's a simple procedure, but it comes under the bigger picture, disobedience to Allah Azza wa Jal. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلِ الْأَعْلَى We don't like in Allah to His creation, but if someone, you know, if your boss at work tells you, for example, don't answer the phone, just ignore it, and you pick it up, you're in trouble. But you might argue, well, what happened? What's the big deal? I just picked up the receiver, and it only traveled just barely two feet to my ear. Sure, you can argue mechanically it wasn't a big deal, but it is a big deal considering the bigger picture. You disobeyed your boss, and we don't like in Allah to His creation. Or the chauffeur, you know, the, the big shot in the back of the limousine tells him make a right turn, and he makes a left turn. Yeah, he can argue that mechanically, instead of turning the wheel this way, I just turned it that way. What's the big deal? The big deal is you disobeyed, that's why. You get your last paycheck. So that's it. So you give the bigger, you get people to understand the bigger picture. And this guy, he was looking at the small process of saying, give me a number nine. But the bigger picture is you're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, why doesn't God appear to us and just address us directly? It was actually a professor. He says, why doesn't God come on TV and talk to us? And can you imagine something so ridiculous? Alright, we have other issues. What channel is this going to be on? And Super Bowl commercials are like, you know, a million dollars a second. What is this one going to cost him? God's on TV. And there's going to be rights and, and networks are going to fight over this. And... But what's the bigger picture? What's the bigger picture? Fadl, Tariq. Where's the test there? The whole idea is the unseen. You know, most of the times you see when, when someone gets to a point where they see the unseen, they can't repent anymore. True? And when Fir'aun saw the angel of death, or look for any atheist in the history of life, when the angel of death came towards them, they're like, oh, there is something. For sure, right? Every atheist believed at that point. But it's too late because you saw something from the unseen. So if God appears to someone, what would be the test in life? There would be no test whatsoever. So and a lot of times we tell them, using analogies, which is the next point, Tell me if you have an exam on your professor is threatening you the whole year, the exam, the exam, the exam. And then you come in and the answers are on the board. Is it a test? It's not a test when you see the answers. So if God comes and appears to people and speaks to people directly, then what's the, there's no test then. What are you being tested on? Um, if God is capable of doing anything, then why can't He beget a son if He wants to? Christians ask you that question. Is God capable of doing anything? You say, okay. Can He have a son if He wants to? Then you're stuck here. Okay. Well, he could if He wanted to. Well, so He had, He wanted to. And He was uh, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who is it? Fadal. It's eternal. When you define God as eternal, He can have, He can't be good or not be God, because otherwise He won't qualify as eternal God. You're right. And, and from, from being technical Islamically, yes, you're absolutely correct. How do I get this person to see the bigger picture here? Any other comparisons, maybe? Fadal. Okay, very good. So, uh, and we'll take another sister and then I'll explain what he said. Oh, you can't hear the questions? Okay, my apologies. Um, I was, okay, so I was going to repeat that one. He's saying that, uh, basically he's explaining that, you know, the idea of having a son, this is, uh, this is a good thing for humans, and it's necessary for humans, you know. The sun carries on your name, and it helps you on towards the end of your life as you're weak, and so on and so forth. But this is not a, a, a quality that is, that is good or befitting of a God. And so our answer here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only does things that befit His majesty. So you can ask other questions. And a lot of times, and, and we've done this before, someone will come up to you and say, well, can God have a son if He wants to? So you ask them, can God steal? Can God lie? Can God murder? Not kill, murder. Because murder is an unjustifiable homicide. So can God murder people? Can God steal from people? Can, can He lie? He only does things that befit His majesty. And that's the other answer to the rock question. You know, 
So that with the rock question, the, the big rock that no one can move and so on, the answer there is that, first of all, you're giving these human qualities to Allah, of building a rock and, and physically moving it. This, these are human qualities. So it doesn't apply here. Yeah? And same thing here. So yes, God is capable of doing anything, but He only does things that befit His majesty. That's why He doesn't steal, that's why He doesn't murder, that's why He doesn't have children. So, okay. Um, number five, you use analogies. So to explain issues and concepts, if the person still doesn't understand, use a simpler analogy. So if you give someone an analogy, they don't understand it, give a simpler one. Where do we get this rule from? Anybody? Where do we get that rule from? Yes, sir. Naam? Yes, from the Quran. Which one specifically, anyone remember? Which incident? Where someone gave an analogy, the guy just didn't get it, so they gave him a more simple analogy, and he was stumped. فَبُوهِتَ الَّذِي كَفَرَ أَحْسَنْ Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? When he came to the king in Namrud, so he says, Rabbi الَّذِي يُحْيِ وَيُمِيتِ My Lord is the one who gives life, and then he takes life. So the guy says, I give life, and I take life. And the narration says that he brought an innocent man to kill him. And he had someone that was condemned to death and set him free. He really didn't get it, did he? He just totally didn't get the idea. He didn't get the comparison whatsoever. You, Ibrahim alayhi salam didn't tell him, well, look, well, you know, Look, Allah already gave him life, a new basic... He didn't explain it like that, he just moved on to something else. He, he noticed he's... He realized he's dealing with a dimwit, so... He, right? And the guy's not smart at all, so he just gave him something very clear. Okay? So this, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the sun up from the east, so you bring it up from the west. And he, and it's a simple argument, but because he's such a... Like again, a dimwit... That Allah Azza wa says, فَبُوهِتَ الَّذِي كَفَرَ He was stumped. Yeah? So sometimes, and some people are like that. That they hear a sophisticated argument, just doesn't do anything for them. Then a dumb one, they're like, huh? You remember this with, uh, with Imam Ahmad? When he tells Al-Mu'tasim, uh, because Mu'tasim was a, a soldier. And he wasn't like a scholar, or he, doesn't, he wasn't into books. He was just a soldier, you know, no brains and... So when he tells him, he, he, all the arguments for the three days where they were debating him, and he was giving brilliant academic ans, uh, arguments, they didn't work. Which is the one that worked on the Khalifa? When he told him, I came to pray, and the Qur'an was lying dead in the corner. The Khalifa was like, how does the Qur'an die? He was like, well that's what you say, because it's created, and everything that's created has an end. So the Qur'an died last night. What does the Khalifa do? It's, just, it's a simple argument. The Khalifa sits down, Qaharana Ahmad. Ahmad has destroyed us. He was telling you brilliant stuff for two days. This is how he destroyed you? Because he's at that level. Yani. So Namrud was the same thing. Yeah, he had to be given a simpler explanation, simpler analogy. Then it worked for him. So here we are, point number five. You use analogies to explain concepts and issues. If the person doesn't get the analogy, maybe use a simpler one. Or sometimes if they don't use it, don't insist. Just move on to something else. Like I know brothers who they have an analogy and they love it. So they always use it. If the person doesn't get it, they try to keep explaining. No, no, the car is blue. The car is blue. You're in the car. It's rolling down the hill. Leave the car. Just move on to something else. Don't insist on your analogy because you love it. You know, you love it because it works. If it doesn't work on this guy, use something else on this guy. So, uh, if God is good. Now remember, this is similar to the other one that we did. The flip side. You know, why does God allow bad things to happen? But, but now we're answering it using analogies only. So give me an answer now, just using a, a comparison or some kind of analogy. If God is good, why does He allow so much evil on earth? Give me just an analogy to answer this. Anybody? If God is good, why does He allow so much evil on earth? Now. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, very good. So you're using the analogy of uh, you know, parents punishing their children. So... So they love them, but then they allow something bad to happen, like a, like a little bit of a spanking, right? I always say, a good spanking never hurt nobody, except the recipient, right? So, um, by the way, did you ever watch any of the crazy videos for this course? No? You watch the levitation? The coke trick? Backhanding the child, you ever watch that one? Excellent, great. So we're on the same page then. So you know what I'm talking about then. So, okay, so that's an analogy. What other analogies are there? Sisters, let's hear from you. So if God is good, you've taken the raise of faith. You remember when he spoke, Sheikh spoke about evil. Now.
Okay, very good. So if I understood you correctly, you're attributing the evil here to people, right? Not to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's the truth. Yani Allah Azza wa didn't just you know, put evil. He told us the, the right way to do things. And then when we choose to not do it, what happens? Evil happens. So a good analogy here is the, the glass jar analogy. Anyone heard this one before? Like, and one time I was walking in a parking lot, it was, it was bright outside, and a non-Muslim said, yeah, I understand that, but if there is a God and if He is good, why, does, why is there so much evil on this earth? So he is trying to say, God is good, but He's doing so much evil. So I told him, and it was bright, we're standing outside. I said, if I give you a glass jar, clear glass jar now, can you hand it back to me full of darkness? And he actually said, I see your point. He immediately got the analogy. Because the analogy is saying, you can't have darkness if there's light, right? Darkness doesn't occur by itself. It only happens when there is, when, as a lack of, or as a result of the lack of something else. When there's no light, you get darkness. When people choose to not follow the light or the guidance of Allah Azza wa Jal, you get evil. So you don't attribute it to Allah Azza wa Jal, you know? So, or if you, you know, the other comparison is cold, right? Cold and heat. Cold doesn't exist by itself. Cold only happens when there is no energy or no heat. That's why you have absolute zero. It doesn't get any colder than that because that's when there's zero energy. So, you can use that. Cold only happens when there's no heat. Darkness only happens when there's no light. Evil happens when people don't follow the light of Allah. So, this analogy works. I just said, can you give me a glass jar full of darkness? He immediately said, I see where you're going with this. He got it immediately. Fadl. Sure, sure, go ahead. I think as human beings, human beings always have to question of their own. Am I doing justice? But always question, you know, why does this happen? But I might do the same thing. So human beings always do that. So when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I think the best way to do it is when you do too much analogy, you bring it down, comparing Allah to the human nature. So I think it's just best to when people ask. And you're actually a step ahead of us because that's actually an entirely different technique when you talk about uh, the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the knowledge that Allah Azza has that you don't have. What, what khair happens to you as a result of this evil from 10 years ago? You know, all this, it's an entirely different section and it's very valid what you're saying. And the only thing I would invite you to do is to. Uh, because the example I gave you, we're not comparing anything to Allah, we're just explaining how evil is not attributed to Allah. That evil happens when people don't follow the, the light of Allah. Just like darkness happens when people don't, don't have light. That's the only comparison we we're making. And what I would like to bring to your attention is, I gave you a story where it worked. So I actually don't want you to like this technique. I just want you to accept that it could work with some people. It wouldn't be your preferred choice of argument or explanation. But I just want you to see that it could work. And that's all I'm trying to do in these four days, that I might give you an argument, and I'll tell you a story where it worked, and you might tell yourself, okay, it worked, but I don't like it, I'm not going to use it. Feel free, absolutely. So yes, there are other ways to explain this, and, and they might even be more satisfactory, and you might meet someone that's more satisfied when you explain this to them. Fadl. And, and this is where we, we use the flip side again. Yani, Many times we get questions like that. For the atheists will say things like, there was a mudslide in, in the Philippines and you know, how many hundreds of children died. So, okay, what do you want to happen? So you want just the parents to die and the children to remain? Is that what you want? And your argument is even that you know, adults should die but children shouldn't. I mean, for me as an adult, I don't agree with that. <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> why are you telling me it's okay if I die and if the child shouldn't die? You know, so that's one thing. So the flip side is okay. What do you want? The mudslide happens. 
Then the rescue team comes. Everybody's dead, but all the children are just, you know, muddy and staring wide-eyed, and they're all alive, like a couple of hundred children, which now need to be put in homes and all kinds of other things. And of course, they only think of one world, especially the atheist, right? But these, they got a free pass to Jannah, these kids. That's great. They don't have to do anything haram. They don't have to commit zina or anything. They got a free pass. Yeah? So these are, there are bigger pictures. But again, you keep pushing his, extending his argument, and he's going to find out that he is asking for too much. So he doesn't want any child to die. He doesn't want any child to fall and get a scrape and a scratch on his knee or anything. And so you keep extending his argument, and he'll find, he will find that he's asking for what, a euphoria or something that's impossible. So just keep pushing his thought further. Yeah? Someone else had their hand up somewhere there? How about sisters? Anyone have their hand up? We're not doing Q&A yet, yeah? But just if you're on our topic, go ahead. Yes, sister. You're saying that uh, eventually everyone's going to die. So regardless of uh, the method, uh, only one time that stays alive. So everyone eventually will have their life to make excuses that is that is that kind of accurate? That you're saying eventually everyone's going to die? Oh, excellent. So we're only here. Zakal Khair, sister. Very good. And we're only here to go back to him. So some people go out in a mudslide. Some people go out in a sports car. And some people just don't wake up. Yeah? No. Yeah. Sometimes I explain in a way that if I poke a knife in your stomach, mm-hmm. that's going to be evil thing to do. Hey, well. When you get sick, then you go to the doctor. And he'll operate you. The same evil thing is mm-hmm. Ah, I like that. Okay. I like the beginning especially. It says, if I poke a knife in your stomach, you'll die. Uh, but if you get an illness and then you go to a doctor, and then he'll use also a, a knife or a scalpel, a cutting instrument. But same kind of thing, but in a good way. Okay, very good. Excellent. But, uh, is there a God? Well, let me just skip that one. We'll come back to it. Uh, there's only one life and there's no resurrection. How much time do we have? Okay, good. There's only one life, there's no resurrection. Using analogies only, how can you explain this? That there's got to be more than one life. Um, oh, let me share it with you. Uh, Fadl, go ahead. Aha, uh-huh, excellent. So this injustice, it's a big question here. How will the injustices in the world be balanced out, is what the brother said. Excellent. You know, let me explain this from uh, a number of different ways, yeah? Um, I remember one, now, Fadl Abdullah. Okay, so how can you see Allah's mercy if you don't, what did you say? Okay, if there isn't some punishment, if there isn't some bad, how will you realize the value of the good? And this is true, we all know that, right? Those of you who grew up in the States and then you went overseas, you, you come to value a lot of things that you have here. You know that they're so good when you see so bad, yeah? Complain about things here, complain about roads, complain about that. Then go overseas, look at the roads, and they like, come back like, kiss the tarmac. <laughs> uh-huh. This is great. <laughs> so you see the bad, you can appreciate the good, right? Um, you know, one time there was a reporter on uh, public radio, NPR. She started to become an atheist, and she started to document her thoughts for her show. She said, the first day a voice said to me, there is no God. She said, the second day it became louder. The third day it became louder. There is no God. And I became convinced that there is no God. She said, after about a week of being an atheist, this is to quote her own words, she said, suddenly it hit me. So Hitler just died? She kept repeating it. Hitler just died? And it didn't make sense to her. That if there is no God, someone can be responsible for the death of so many people, and that's all that happened to him is that he died. He's not going to be punished. He's not going to pay for it. He just died. You know, recently in Toronto, an atheist was telling me, uh, you know, he's saying, yeah, there should be a reward. There should not be any reward, no punishment. So what? I told him, uh, so Hitler, do you think it's fair that nothing happens to Hitler? And he just started staring at me. And he just said, yeah. <laughs> I said, you wouldn't do anything to Hitler? He's like, N- no. And you can tell he's lying, right? Yeah. So at first he's like, you know. So you know, sometimes people just want to win the argument, right? And he knows he, his hesitation, his discomfort. He knew he, he didn't really believe that. So this woman, she just kept saying, Hitler just died? And that's all that happens to him? So she's actually pulling and drawing on a concept that's in the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, أَفَنَجْعَلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ كَالْمُجْرِمِينَ 
مَالَكُمْ كَيْفَ تَحْكُمُونَ Very strong verses. Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying, do we equate like the, يعني the, the evil doers, the transgressors, yeah? Like the criminals, do we equate them to the believers? Then Allah says something, مَالَكُمْ What's wrong with you? How do you judge? How do you judge? So if someone is go doing good their entire life, then they die and they're buried and there is no life after death. And someone is doing bad their entire life, murdering and stealing. And they die, they're buried, and there's no life after death. Did they go to the same place? They went to the same place. There's no reward, there's no punishment. And that's not fair. So if someone tells you, there is a God, but we're not resurrected. We live once, we're not resurrected. Then especially if they say there is a God, you can follow the following technique. You can ask them number one. To describe God, you said there is a God, but He's not going to resurrect us. He just gave us this one life. So what is this God? What's His description? No doubt they're going to use things, words in the positive sense about God. They're going to say He's wise, He's intelligent, He's powerful, He's fair, He's just. So now this fair and just God, you're telling me, He's all, all knowledgeable and intelligent. And He doesn't know the concept of reward. He doesn't understand the concept of retribution. And the analogy we've, we always use, it's an old one, yani. But it's like the child that falls down and hits its head on the table. The child will keep crying until the mother says, Bad table. Bad table. Bad table. Hits the table. The, stop, the child stops crying. True, sisters? The child stops crying because even this two-year-old who still cannot speak, understands the concept of reward and punishment, understands retribution. And the child knows that now the table got hit the same way it hit me, the child stops crying. How can a child who doesn't speak know this concept and you're telling me God doesn't know this concept? So that's the analogy. We tell them that the, if there is a God, then there absolutely must be a resurrection. Because there has to be reward and punishment. Yeah? People get away with it. Someone murders you, takes you away from your children, you don't get to see them live or graduate or get married, or you don't get to see your grandchildren. He did a lot of injustice to you. Nothing happens to him. And you don't get anything back and nothing. It's just not fair. And work with another analogy, if you don't like the bad table one, um, you know, animals, they understand retribution, right? Um, the monkey, the monkey at your local zoo. When you offend the monkey, he flings things at you, right? If you want to know what, just go to the zoo, <laughs> offend the monkey, but just take an umbrella and extra clothing, and you'll see what he'll do. He understands getting back at people, yeah? And other animals do that, camels get back at you, right? You mistreat a camel, he'll get a chance, he'll just grind you into the ground, will crush you, right? I used to always talk about another example of uh, the bird called the honey guide. Anyone heard of that? Anyone heard this example? You know, this bird in Africa that uh, when it finds uh, a beehive, it comes to you, looks you in the eye, starts to sing and it starts to flutter its wings and it guides you to the honey. And so the idea is, you know, humans, they have means and ways to, to remove the honey, smoke and all that. And then after they eat from the honey, they have to leave some for the bird. That's the, that's the whole deal. You can watch it, by the way, on YouTube. Just search Honey Guide. And you'll see videos of it calling people, or, or calling even uh, badgers, because they have thick fur and protects them from the bee stings. And it'll just go, go from branch to branch, guiding people to the honey. Now, they, they say that this bird, if you, uh, if you don't leave it any honey, it tells you, don't worry about it. I know another place where there's honey. And it keeps calling you again and again, and it takes you to the territory of a vicious animal that will attack you. It's a bird. It understands getting even. It understands retribution. You tell me God doesn't understand it? So, uh, so these are just some analogies you can use to explain that there is life after death. There is a resurrection. If you say there is a God, then there absolutely has to be a resurrection. Otherwise, this is an unfair God. Alright, uh, D. Why should I pray if my final destination is written? And this is from Muslims, right? They ask you this. Someone's just moping around the house. Tell me, get up and pray. Why should I pray? Allah wrote down if I'm going to paradise, if I'm going to the hellfire. So why should I pray? And if, if He wrote down I'm going to the hellfire, I can pray all night and still go there. So any analogies here? There's some simple ones and some Khalid Fadl. Okay. 
Okay. So, so we're limited by space and time. Our knowledge is limited. And you're applying the same thing to God. And that's why you think... Yeah? Type. You had your hand up? Uh, I was going to say that Allah didn't create the track. That if your car is driving on the track, if the car, you know how to work. It works. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so then you're saying that... Uh, when it comes to predestination, I mean? Yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. So he created the human being. He knows your tendencies. He knows how you're going to behave. And he knows what you're going to do in every situation. So excellent. So uh, now with the Muslim, let, let's, give, let's give two answers here. So there's the, this is an age-old question. And it's, a, it's nothing new. And the scholars have answered this since a thousand years ago. And they make a simple comparison to rizq. Because your provision is written, right? Allah wrote down the money that you will make and everything. So this guy who doesn't pray, he you know, gets up early for work and everything. And you know, does the whole Gillette thing. And he goes to work. He works hard for this rizq. So you tell him, well, Allah wrote down your rizq. So why don't you just stay home? And since Allah wrote it, it's going to happen anyways. See here, when it comes to rizq and money in the pocket, people now become logical. So now you can make this comparison. That you're saying, why should I pray? Allah wrote down where I'm going. You tell him, okay, why should you work? Allah wrote down how much money you're going to get anyways. So now he begins to understand that it's linked to your action. There's another analogy that, that I like very much. Yeah? And I thought I invented it, then I read it on a slam QA. So I was happy, I wasn't upset. I was more happy because now I feel more confident in, in sharing it. I shared it with Shaykh Walid Basuni when he taught the Qadr part. And he said he didn't like it because of this. And I said, when I explain it, I say that. He said, now you have the green light. So, I'm confident in this one. So basically, this is an analogy. We don't liken Allah to His creation. Where we say that, uh, hypothetically, there's a teacher. And this teacher, he has three students, but he knows his students very well. All right? He's going to give them an exam. He knows that Muhammad is going to get 100%, most likely, because he knows Muhammad very well. So he takes out a blank sheet of paper, he writes down, Muhammad will get 100 on this exam. And he knows Ahmed very well, and he knows Ahmed is going to get 75% on the exam. So he writes down, Ahmed will get 75% on the exam. And then there's Ali, and he knows Ali is going to flunk. He's getting 50. On this. So he writes down, Ali will probably get 50% on this exam. He folds this piece of paper, he puts it in his drawer, the three young men walk in, and they take the exam. And sure enough, Muhammad gets 100, Ahmed gets 75, and Ali gets 50%. So then, the professor wants to show them how well he knows them, and how he predicted what they're going to do. So he pulls out the sheet of paper and says, you see, I wrote it down beforehand. Ali then, can Ali look at the, the piece of paper and say, that's why I got 50%, because you wrote I'm going to get 50%. Now, the only, the only thing wrong with this analogy is that the teacher is guessing, but Allah Azzawajal has knowledge of the future. Precise, detailed, and excellent knowledge of the future. So Allah Azzawajal knew that you're going to get 50, so He wrote you're going to get 50. You're not going to get 50 because He wrote it. He just wrote what He knows you're going to do. So, if, so what's written about your final destination isn't, it's not what's going to guide you to that destination. Allah just wrote because He knows where you're going to end up in. And where you're going to end up is going to depend on the series of events and things that you do in your life. And so Allah wrote that you're going to get 50,000 a year because you're going to apply for this job and get the job. But if you sleep and wait for the 50,000, it's not going to come. So that's basically the analogy. Yani. And, and that's why the, the, yani, the concept of, of Qadr it can't be that difficult. Yani Allah Azawajal, and that's why the Imam Abu, Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said, that Allah Azawajal wouldn't reveal a concept that's just impossible to understand for people. It's just not, that's not how it works. That's Christianity. Islam, things make sense. Things can be explained. Yeah? So, that's an analogy. The one we skipped was uh, B, is there a God? Because basically why I put this there is that if there, if, there, if there is a God, or if there wasn't a God, how did the majority of people on earth come to believe that there is a God? If there is no God whatsoever, how did this idea, these books, and, and these names of prophets, and the belief that there is a creator, where did that come from? 
And we all know the fitrah, right? So you can have people just in the wild, they believe in some kind of deity. And you've all seen these documentaries of very primitive people that can be in Papua New Guinea or this place or the Yanomami tribe. or Very primitive, but they believe in God or gods. So where do they get this idea from if there isn't a God? And so, and for example, if uh, suppose you live in an apartment building and you have no indication that you have an upstairs neighbor. You've never seen one, no one ever informed you of him, you never heard any noise from him or anything. Would you believe that you have an upstairs neighbor? You wouldn't. And so why would people believe that there is a God above unless he announced his presence in one way or another? So anyways, these are just some analogies and let's see if we can finish. Uh, we'll do six, that's page 64. You use stories, right? And that's obviously anyone who's given da'wah here or anyone who's called the Muslims back to Allah or non-Muslims to Allah Azawajal, you use stories in explaining things or you share incidents that happen to, to other people. So, um, okay, so for example, so I'm going to read from the notes. And by the way, sometimes I do read from the notes. And I'm saying this because some students, they're offended when you read from the notes, okay? Because they feel like, okay, it's, you know, why are you just reading to us? You know, it's like, get your own stuff and... But I wrote the notes, so, so it's okay. Yeah? You know, when I did the course in South Africa, this was a big complaint. Sometimes you read. Don't read. Okay. So it's like more original if I don't read. Yeah? I wrote it. Yeah. Sometimes, actually, if I said it, I would say it the same way it's written, so it doesn't hurt. To, so bear with me as I read. Yeah. But, uh, for example, uh, and this is... Um, a is someone who likes to create problems between people, loves to make problems between people. This was actually a story that was used, used by a great scholar. And I think you guys took uh, torchbearers, right? Yeah? So you know about uh, Amr al-Shaabi, great scholar, right? Brilliant. You know about Ibrahim and nakhai these two are old, always together. Who is more knowledgeable, Amr al-Shaabi or Ibrahim and nakhai They were contemporaries and good friends. Who is more knowledgeable? Anyone know? The narration says, uh, uh, مَجْتَمَعَ الشَّعَبِ وَإِبْرَاهِيمِ إِلَّا وَسَكَتَ Ibrahim. It says, any time a Shaabi and Ibrahim gathered together, Ibrahim would be quiet. That means, Shaabi is the more knowledgeable one. So, uh, Imam al-Shaabi, rahimahullah, he w would tell stories to adults, but there's a wisdom behind them. So he said there's a story where the lion, he, got, he fell ill. The lion, the king of the jungle, fell ill. So everybody visited the lion except for the fox. The wolf being a troublemaker, being aware that the fox still hasn't visited the lion, started to create problems. So he started to tell the lion, look, everybody came to you, everyone visited you except for that wolf. Oh, except for the fox, sorry. So then the lion started to get upset towards the fox. News reached the fox. So he came rushing to the lion. And he came to him. And he says, uh, the king says to him, Ya Abu al-Hussein, to the fox, you, all the animals visited me except you. So the fox tells him, yani may Allah rectify your condition. When you fell ill, everyone came to visit you, but I immediately ran out looking for a cure for your illness. And the king says, did you find the cure? He says, yes. I found that the cure for what ails you is in the paw of a wolf. <laughs> and so the king then lunged at the wolf and tore up his paw and the fox slowly slid out and he waited outside. So then the, fox, the wolf comes out limping and the fox tells him, oh you with the red socks, because now he's bleeding, it looks like he's wearing red socks, yeah? Ya sahib al khuf al ahma. If you sit after this with the sultan, with those that are in charge, be careful of what you say because it can come back to hurt you. So he just told this story. And what he's trying to say, troublemakers, beware. Don't create problems. This is, applies to the office. You know, don't try to make the boss hate that person and fire him. He could come back to haunt you. you know, don't try to get near close to the governor or to the president and make him try to hurt this person or kill that person. And if you look at the lives of imams, you find always that there's a problem they had with the khalifa or someone. And it's usually because of some snake that's near the Khalifa. He tells him this person you know, doesn't come to you and he doesn't believe in, and he thinks your money is haram. Always some snake 
creating some problems. So, or example B there, no one can take the shahada after just 10 minutes of talking. So if I were to convince this Muslim, then I'll just give him many of the stories. Many of the stories were someone takes shahada in 7 minutes, someone takes shahada in 8 minutes, and there are many other stories where the person doesn't take shahada, right? Or any months before they take the shahada, because it's not a guarantee. One time we were actually we were in New Jersey, we did the workshop on a Saturday, and then Sunday we went to the streets doing some da'wah. Then we reconvened at the end of the day, and each group was talking about how many shahadas they got. They were, we were going like this, group one, one shahada, group two, two shahadas, group three, one shahada. And then when it came, and I was watching this young man, he's in the crowd, and he's just watching each group and how many shahadas they have, and I saw his eyes when it came, my, when it was my group's turn, to say how many shahadas we have. Then he asked, your group? And then I was, he was like this. And then we said zero. And he was like, Phew. what? All this talk yesterday about shahadas and, and your group gets zero? Yeah, because it's not, it's not a guarantee. and It's not magic. So, it happens like that sometimes. You know, sometimes we're going to discuss the rules of giving advice. How to get your advice accepted. One time I followed all of the rules. And it still backfired on me. This sister used to smoke at the university. She was wearing hijab and everything, just, just like a chimney, just puffing away in front of everybody. So the sisters came to me and told me to go and advise her. I thought maybe as her older brother I can give advice and she might accept it from me. And I started off with all the rules of giving advice. I praised her in the beginning and I acknowledged all the good work that she does for da'wah and everything. Then I gave her the advice. And she let me have it. Well, I'm talking kind of stuff, you know. <laughs> she was like, you are not the imam here. She just let me have it. And I remember that night I went to my friend's house and everyone's laughing and joking. I was just sitting like... They're like, what's wrong with you? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> Let me have it. But you know, so sometimes th things work, sometimes it doesn't work. The good news is you get rewarded for your attempts. It doesn't matter. It's not like you only get rewarded if something happens. If, some, if someone takes the shahada, or if the Muslim actually starts to pray and, and takes your advice, only then you get a reward. No, you get reward anyway. Just like Nuh salam called his people for 950 years. Just a few followed and believed. Does that mean he doesn't get reward for the 950 years? No, you get the reward inshallah. Okay. Um, we have 15 minutes and we actually finished all the, uh, the six ways of answering questions. So we could actually, we could take questions or we could do something else. What would you like to do? Take questions? Naam. Oh, joke request in the room. Wow. You guys tired already? Or you just want to hear a joke? Okay. Alright, so Brother Khaled is insisting on a joke right now. Actually, I didn't bring my joke list with me, but no problem. Okay, there is a, there is a, <laughs> there is a guy. He dialed the wrong number. This is a joke, by the way. Let me explain something, because I got this question in New Jersey. They said, you know, why are you telling us jokes, you know, isn't that a lie? So here's the idea, yeah? If, if I warn you that I'm about to tell you a joke, how on earth is that a lie? <laughs> it's not, right? And if I say, here's a joke, one person is like, okay, this is a true story, right? <laughs> it's a joke. Now, it would be a lie if I presented the joke as a true story, then it's a lie. But if I warn you that it's a joke, it's not a lie. And if it's clear that it's a joke, it's not a lie either. And if I tell you, there was a bear driving a Chrysler 300 going to work. Yeah, and here, any sane person will understand, okay, this is a joke. If anyone is like, which highway was this on? <laughs> that guy is, shouldn't be in the class, right? So that, way, that means then, when you... Uh, when you say it's a joke, it's not a lie. And sometimes, and I understand, you will find, and you may have a sheikh that you respect, and I will respect that opinion as well, that will, will be a bit strict if you want to use that term. Like one time, one of our friends, there was a wedding, and he, there was a stage, and he went up on stage, and they did a skit. And we know his name is so-and-so, and he went up and he pretended he had a different name. He was trying to wed the guy's daughter. It was a very funny skit, it was great. When he came down, one sheikh told him, how dare you get up on stage and lie. Like, what do you mean lie? It's like, you pretended to be someone else. You faked a scenario that wasn't true. Yes, but they were on stage and we said it's a skit. So how is that? And nobody believed that. Oh, oh, this is, oh, I hope he gives him his daughter. No one really believed it. 
So it's not a lie, yani. I know some, some, I know there will be scholars, I respect that they say that, you know, acting is lying to people because, yeah, but it's lying, but yeah, is it lying if we know they're acting? How is it lying? I know he's acting. So, when I say it's a joke, that means it's not a true story, it's not a lie, so don't worry. But if you don't appreciate that, I can respect your opinion, but I'm still going to tell the joke, so you just ignore this part. Yeah? So, this guy, he dials a wrong number, and a girl picks up. And uh, from her voice, he feels that she's beautiful. And I'll tell you an interesting psychological point here. Psychologists say that this is one thing that humans can almost never get right. P hear someone's voice and picture what they look like accurately. It's almost never that way. And you know, I used, to do, I used to have a radio show, and when people would see me in person, they would always say the same thing. You're Kamal al Maki. You're Kamal al Maki. Like, yeah, I'm Kamal al Maki. No problem with that. So, uh, so he calls up, with this, he does this wrong number. The girl picks up, and from her voice, he feels that she's pretty, you know? So he starts chatting with her, you know, macking and stuff. And so they agreed to meet. He said, where do you want to meet? He said, we'll meet at the, or the, or the juice place. So okay, 12 o'clock, we'll meet at the juice place. She said, how am I going to recognize you? He said, I'm going to be holding a glass of mango juice. And he said, how am I going to know you? She said, I'm going to wear a dress, this color, that, this color, and that shape, and so on and so forth. So he goes to the juice place, you know, a little bit before 12. Can I get a glass of mango juice? I'm sorry, we're fresh out of mango juice. What? Do you have anything else that's orange in color, orange juice, anything? No. Only thing he found was some lemonade. So he takes the lemonade, he's just standing holding lemonade, 12 o'clock, the girl walks in, wearing the dress that she promised and everything. But he realizes she is really, really unattractive. So he's like, alhamdulillah, they didn't have any mango juice. <laughs> so she walks up to him, says, uh, aren't you Hassan? He's like, excuse me? She's like, aren't you Hassan? He's like, no, I'm not Hassan. I've never heard no Hassan. She's like, she recognized his voice. She says, no, you're Hassan. He's like, no, I don't know any. You're Hassan. We spoke on the phone. We said we're going to meet here. He said, what's the matter with you, woman? Does this look like mango juice to you? <laughs> so... <laughs> Thank you for the, the joke manager. There are plenty of more good ones, those of you who will be with us the next four days. <laughs> okay. Uh, so how about this then? We don't need to really stay until 10. How about we break? We meet up tomorrow, inshallah, 10 o'clock, bright and early. And for those of you who are still on the fence, yeah, I know there's going to be so much stuff. And, it's, and people will, uh, will come up to me and say, it wasn't just da'wah, it was just... Just life, how to deal with everybody, you know. So, Jazakumullah Khairan for being an excellent and responsive audience. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Sallallahu alayhi wa barakatuh. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.